Hey, how are you? What's going on? Hey, uh, let's. we're looking at magazines. This is another magazine video, just like the last one. This is a stack. came out of a, another one of these containers, like this, right here, that was, that was down on the bottom shelf. I'm, I'm reorganizing, so I pulled them out. So I'm going to put these where they belong eventually. But we're going to look at this whole stack, and we're going to go through, and it's going to be about a half hour. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, let's just go. I'll, I'm going to set them here, and then I'm going to pull them up. So we can get a better focus on the magazines themselves. And boy, I did this last night as well. I think this is okay. This is a smaller size magazine. So we're going to start with this ish issue of 8-Ball. Excuse me. I really, really like 8-Ball. And I really, really like this writer and artist, Daniel Close. Uh, this is when I first discovered Daniel Close would have been, I have several issues of 8-Ball, so it would have been the, the early 90s that I discovered his stuff, and so it would have been before he gained some popularity and uh, and uh, got that film project, and, or completed this stuff, and then eventually some of the stories from 8-Ball became that movie, Ghost World that uh, many of us love so much. I really love it. So, I I really, I can't recommend 8-Ball or anything by Daniel Close uh, enough to you. I can't recommend it enough. So, you can already see the art style here on the cover is really cool. It's very reminiscent of the 1950s, in my opinion. Uh, it, almost, it, uh, it almost looks like a Dell comic. Now, when you get on the inside, he very much does that sort of thing. He has uh, short vignette stories that involve sets of characters that typically what he will do is it will be a broad spanning story and he'll introduce different characters. See, look at this. Obviously, he's doing something similar to, to Peanuts here. But it, it's edgy and it's uh, it's artsy without being pretentious and lame uh look here's the, i remember this this is this see look obviously this is a dell comics thing he's making this look like a comic about leopold and Loeb, and so i think this is the first time i learned about leopold and, and Loeb. whenever i read this whenever this came out when it was like 1992 or something see look at this so you can see the attraction. If this looks good to you and interesting, oh, she's got a, a mass on her breast or something. Her, right, look, it, it's the Flintstones. Oh, man, this is so cool. Okay, I'm just kind of uh, remembering this. It's been a good 10 or 15 years since I read this. This kid, I remember this kid. Okay, that's that was great. I hope you guys pick up 8-Ball by Daniel Close. And now look at in the in a similar vein, boy. This was let's just go like this. In a similar similar vein, the next book we'll look at is Neat Stuff. This is Peter Bag. This is a bummer, but I'm pretty sure I bought this in a quarter bin, and it came like this. That's that's the reason why it's like this. This is some of the earliest the earliest Peter Bag stuff that I read, and he's also really good. His most famous property and comic is is titled Hate, and the character, the main character in Hate is named Buddy Bradley. And Buddy Bradley is, is a, he's like one of us. He's like, a, he's a, I you can't even say any more than that. So these are comics that are about the subculture of collecting. Not just comics, but records and books and, uh, and ex-girlfriends. If you're, if you're into collecting ex-girlfriends. Uh, the Goon and the Moon. This is outstanding. So what I can tell you right off the bat is you're going to be, if you've never seen Peter Bagg's art before, you are you might be th pushed off by it because you might be like, what the hell is going on? I, what, I can't even see what's happening. What are these people who, what, they're so weird looking. Like, look, this is supposed to be a stripper right here. So his style could be off-putting at first to the uh, to the novice or to the to the non-initiated, but once you become initiated, you will appreciate this. So this is like a cartoon. 
this is like uh, his drawing is like a cartoon from the 1960s and his humor is funny AF it's it's really good you guys it's it's good I mean I think it's good Peter bag neat stuff or hate is also Peter bag Freaky Monsters, the magazine for gold, golden age monster lovers, number 10. I must have got this. I got this at a shop marked down. See that slash right there? I think this was $2 at, at, at a comic shop in San Francisco, one of the last comic shops. I don't go there anymore, but it was one of the, one of the few comic shops here in San Francisco that I used to uh, give my business to, but I did buy this there. It's a very nice cover, isn't it? This is nice. This is a quality magazine. It's heavy and uh, very nice. There's this nice 8x10 photo of Eddie. Whole big thing about Eddie in here. Ooh, look at this. This looks great. Freaky Monsters. That looks really good. I mean, it looks good. I, it's like I bought it 10 years ago. I've, I've already looked at it, but to me it looks good because I, we're looking at it again right now. It's fun to look at. It's a beautiful cover. This is Utu. This is one of the most professional and well-put-together uh, homemade zine-type comic that I ever purchased from an artist here in San Francisco at Golden Gate in Golden Gate Park. So in Golden Gate Park... Every year they used to have this, I'm sure they still have it, it's called the Zine Fest. And it's a huge festival, and there's just tons of creators, and I've talked about it before. Anyway, this is a, this, this place, this place in time, like about 2014, whenever this came out, this was a, a, you know, a great time that will probably never come back again. But at this time... There were tons of artists in Golden Gate Park that were creating comic style, uh, skateboard style, whatever the hell, any kind of style art, and they were just selling it in Golden Gate Park, and they were making their own comics and just selling them. But this was pre-internet. It was before the internet that we know now, and a lot of these people are now doing all this stuff like on, you know, on, on fundraising or they're they're creating their comics online. But this this young man. Malachi Ward that I met at Golden Gate Park. He made this comic called Utu. We're going to look at it. It's magazine size. It's a, uh, you can tell it's home, it's hand, it's homemade, but it's made of a nice paper. It, it's like a, like a thicker stock paper, but you can tell he's just, it's just stapled together. He made this. He's, he drew, he drew a little drawing here for me. At the, at the moment that I met him and, and I bought this book, I think, I think this was uh, maybe $10, um, maybe $5, but I'm thinking I might, if, if he had asked $10 for this, I would have given it to him. So it, this was, might've been $10. It says, thanks for getting a comic, Malachi. And then he drew this character that's in here that has these, these cotton, cotton eye blindings. This is a very interesting comic. It's pretty well drawn, but it is very well executed for like a beginner. And uh, I remember enjoying it. It's uh, it's like a uh, it's a Zardoz situation. So, see, so we're starting out with this primitive, this kind of this primitive shaman, and he is uh, he's talking to a queen and he's speaking for a deity because the deity speaks through him and he's a holy man. And then when he goes back to speak to the deity again, of course, the deity turns out to be some dude from the future who's hooked up to some sort of mechanism and he's communicating to this primitive being or maybe this, this is an extraterrestrial, but I can't remember exactly, but I remember it similar to Zardoz. So the guy who... The, what he thinks is a god is is just not a god. It's it's just some guy hooked up to the to the internet. Good. 
I recommend Utu. Maybe maybe it's gone somewhere. It's possible he's made more stuff. Malachi Ward, you could see this is pretty talented for I don't know how I remember this this kid being in his early twenties, the guy that, that that made that. This is another uh homemade zine. This is Venture number one from nineteen seventy two. There's a story behind this. I've had this the entire time since nineteen seventy two. The reason why I have this is because this is made by a, a group of friends in San Jose that went to high school with my older sister. Um, my older sister dated one of these guys. And this guy, Frank Sirocco, right here, he went on to, to do some work for, uh, for mainstream, like for, uh, for Marvel. He drew for Alien Legion and uh, some other stuff, like maybe Epic, maybe um, he's good. And then he's still around. I, I don't know if, how much art he makes, but he owns a really uh, a toy store in San Jose now. I don't, that's probably all uh, vintage at this point. I mean, not vintage. It's probably all uh, on the internet at this point. I can't remember. But So this guy went to high school with my sister. And when they were in high school, they created this homemade fanzine comic, and then they sold them at school. And so my sister always bought them. And I think they put out one for every year of high school they were in. This is the first one. See, Frank Sirocco and Brent Anderson. Brent Anderson went on to, to work for Marvel as well. So it's really good. I loved this when I was a kid. Look, they were selling them for 75 cents. So this Grimley's Tales, I believe is, this is Frank right here. I just so I can't remember. We're gonna to get to it. This is Grimly from Grimly's Tales. So I loved this when I was a kid. So my my sister, who bought these at school and brought them home, had zero interest in this. She probably never even read it. Here's what she did: she bought this comic from Frank at school, brought it home, and said, "Here, do you want this?" And I said, "Yeah." See, look. And so that's and so I coveted this and I coveted all the issues that she later gave me this is a good good one the incident by Brent Anderson so this was really cool stuff that was being created by legitimate high schoolers guys that went to Branham High School in San Jose or who who created this so this is my favorite when I was a kid is Grimley's Tales this is going to be the first the first uh, episode of Grimley's so let's read it Grimley's Tales by Frank Sirocco's script, Brent Anderson Art. This is Grimley. He lives on a small planetoid of rock and moon dust. Yeah. He lives in a small bubble house on the surface of this planet. Yeah. This is a spaceship Grimley has built to escape the boredom of his planet. Yeah. You see, he wants to seek different horizons. Yeah. Experience new wanderlusts. Yeah! Partake in new and exciting adventures. Yeah! Probe out the vastness of the cosmos. Yeah! But up until now, he hasn't succeeded. Yeah. I remember liking this Garthen's Quest. So this could be difficult to find, but it's got to be... I mean, they're, they're probably out there. <laughs> Good luck. No, they're, they're probably out there. Famous Monsters of Filmland. I bought this also at that comic shop on Irving Street in San Francisco. Like one of the last times. This is some of the last purchases that I made at actual comic shops. I didn't really even care how good or bad this magazine was on the inside. I mean, I opened it up and looked through it and thumbed through it. And I was like, okay, well, it's not famous monsters at all. I'm not sure what this is. But whatever it is, uh, I'm fine with it because I really like this cover. And so I bought this for this cover. And this was like eight bucks or something. How much were these back then? Ten bucks? Because this was, I think I bought this new. Ninety nine, ninety nine. What a deal! National Lampoon. It all comes back to National Lampoon. When it comes to magazines, if I'm going to be suggesting 
vintage magazines for you to be reading from the 1970s. <clears throat> National Lampoon is going to be one of them. This is a very, very funny humor magazine. It was also, it's, it, even though it was <laughs> being presented as mainstream, it was very edgy. But nobody really cared because in 1970, America was for the most part a non censorious culture. So nobody cared about this. Nobody was like going to say that, that this was this or that this was that. This was actually funny, is what this was. If you had a brain or a sense of humor, you knew this was funny. This was before Saturday Night Live, this was before any of the National Lampoon movies. This was when all it was was a magazine. What we barely understood, or that what I barely understood, was that this all originated from Harvard University, and that initially this was a, a humor magazine produced by a comedy club type situation at Harvard University. And then it became an actual magazine when this particular generation of creators came along and started making this. Now, I'm often wrong about things, but... Christmas gifts for liberals. See, okay, so this will be interesting. Let's just look at this really fast. White House Romance Comics. Look, it's Trisha Nixon and Prince Charles. Well, he's now King Charles. Look, see what's happening here? You do. Could you imagine a magazine doing this that was sold on the stand? So this was sold in the same place as Time Magazine, Newsweek, TV Guide, a Women's Day, Red Book. This is going to be on the stand next to everything. It's going to be even kind of close to Mad Magazine at times. It's in, in places, in certain places. This might be right next to Mad Magazine, but this is leaps and bounds beyond Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine is like... like Mad Magazine. This is like nothing you have seen. So this is an article of giving you suggestions of Christmas lit Christmas gifts for liberals. And it says right there, end repression now. This is 1970 and they're making fun of liberals already. They're telling you what to get them. Anti-war wall plaque. Beautifully burnished bronze wall plaque is inscribed with the day, month, and year in which the first opposed, with, in which you first opposed the war in Vietnam. One up your dove friends. Shut up your hawk friends. Okay, that, that wasn't that great. Land reform, concerned consumers, of course, radical chic party favors, humane burglar alarm. Protect yourself and defend your actions with this remarkable electronic device. When a would-be housebreaker sets off the alarm, it will immediately send a signal to your local police station. At the same time, start a recording in your home, which will repeat this humanitarian phrase. We sympathize with your situation and are committed to eliminating the deplorable conditions of systemic deprivation, which forces those like yourself into a life of crime. But we must protect our homes and loved ones. Huh. Well, that certainly wouldn't work. Nowadays, we don't... Uh, yeah, they, they would just... They just leave their doors unlocked here if that's the situation. Trophy for the great... Okay, well, that, we can't look at all the National Anthem. The Hembeck File. We saw a Hembeck uh, magazine yesterday. This is another one. This is Fred Hembeck being funny, telling you about uh, his personal history with comics. This is, it's very good. He tells you all the comics that he loves. Like, here's something that's going to be about John Carter. And maybe this is also about that other guy, Gulliver Jones. Look, there's Jimmy Olsen, the red-headed beetle of 1000 B.C. Oh, look at this. I colored this. Isn't that funny? Wow. I kind of did a good job. Look at all that. I almost finished it. It looks nice. I need to go back and finish that. That looks kind of cool. Return of the Jedi, Star Wars, giant 
Collector's Compendium. Heroes, Villains, Creatures, and Droids. Let's open this up. I think this might unfold into a giant poster, you guys. Let's see. Is that what this does? Is that an Ewok or something? No, it's... Okay. Wow. So this was... I got this... I didn't even get this. So this my mother bought this at the supermarket. This is the type of stuff my mother would buy and then bring home from just on a grocery on a on a grocery shopping trip. She might buy and then other people's maybe Gratu's mom did this too. Because she knew I liked this. She knew that I liked this, so she would she bought this at the grocery store or at the pharmacy, but mostly at, she would have bought this at Knob Hill Groceries or uh, Troya's Market, something like that. This is really nice, actually. That, I don't think it... Un, is it unfold? So what is this? Is this 1983? 1982? What year did, did Return of the Jedi come out? 1983. It's 1983. That's neat, right? Have you guys seen that? It's kind of cool. Thanks, Mom. Thank you. She did cool stuff like that all the time. Here's another. What is this from? Double poster issue. Two fantastic posters inside. This would have come from her as well. This woman needed to spend money. I'm the same way. I do it all the time. I buy you guys see the toys that are always... Look at all this stuff. Stuff I don't need. Didn't happen until later on in life for me. Like I lived pretty much a Spartan lifestyle up until about 15 years ago. For many years, I was able to pack all of my belongings into two duffel bags, and it could all fit in the trunk of my Cadillac Coupe de Ville. So, and I slept on a lot of couches, you know, I slept at a lot of girls' houses. You know, after my divorce, after my second divorce, and after I had to sell my house. So... I lived a Spartan lifestyle. This is also my mother. Uh, she bought this as well and gave it to me. It's the Return of the Jedi word puzzle book. It's never been used. It's been just like this the entire time. Oh, I was, was going to say that would be great if it said Sprouse Ret Reitz. That would have been might might have been where she would have got the Sp Sprouse Ritz. Sprouse Reitz, I think is what it used. Sprouse Ritz, I thought they called it. Anyway, it was a five-and-dime store in Pacific Grove that she used to go to. Here's an issue of Mad Scientist. This is such a great cover. This is an interesting, like, small print, also, like, almost like a zine. You know, this is a very awesome cover, though, but Mad Scientist is neat. But it's, it's you know, it's the kind of lower production values, and it's kind of got a... Look at some of the earlier issues you can even see. Kind of has a little bit of a homemade feel to it, but it's very good. It's a, I recommend Mad Scientist if you can... Oh, look, at there's that issue. There's a whole article on Reptilicus. On the Reptilicus comics by Charlton. I have this issue. <laughs> I always just thought that this was a terrible cover, but some people like it. That's an interesting Godzilla... Like a, like a block cut or something. Like a, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. That's cool. Mad Scientist. G-Fan. All right, this is a great... This is the magazine that you want if you're a Godzilla fan. Yeah. If you're a Godzilla fan or if you like giant Japanese monsters, Japanese movies, this is it. G-Fan. A lot of good stuff in here. Just like you might imagine, it's just it's 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 Godzilla stuff. More Return of the Jedi stuff. <sighs> Again, I didn't buy this. This would have come from my mother. This might have been. I don't remember what time of the year this came out, but this one looks like something that she might have put inside of my Christmas stocking. So my mother, from the time I was a little kid, like little, like like. As long as I can remember, three or four. As long as I can remember, she always put a orange in the in the toe of my of my Christmas stocking. That was always the last thing that you would get. So she would put an, an orange in first, 
and she'd put everything in and then she would always stick a comic or a magazine inside of my Christmas stocking at the top. And so every Christmas morning, the first thing that I would typically get on Christmas morning, and then when I would wake up, she would have that stocking would be at the foot of my bed. And uh, so the first thing that I would take out would be the magazine or the comic. And this was probably the Christmas of 1983. It's very possible that that's, this is what she put in the stocking that year for me. It looks great. Very thoughtful. She was always pretty much on top of what I liked. Or she would just ask me. This book belongs to Zachary M. Edmonds. So this came from a quarter bin, I would say. I would say I got this out of a quarter bin. I didn't recognize this. That's why I didn't meet, you know, that's why I didn't say, you know. Well, I looked at it and see how it's beat up. And then did you look at the other stuff that we already looked at, the stuff that my mom gave me. I took care of it. Even the poster magazines, the, the, the I didn't even draw in the Return of the Jedi word and puzzle book. Uh, I took care of these. But so when I saw that empire, I could tell I was like, I don't think this is mine. So yeah, this came later. This came past twenty years or something. I found it somewhere. This I bought new off the stand. I remember this. I used to read a lot of Stephen King, so I read everything. I, uh, you know, when it was popular and new at the time. So I had already read The Lawnmower Man, and. Uh, Man, I can't remember whether, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Dang, that was loud engine. So I'm pretty sure, so I don't remember what happened. There was something about the Lawnmower Man came out after this, and then that movie that wasn't that good came out, but none of it was really that good. I don't remember thinking this was really good. Now this is awesome. This is the King Kong special famous monsters it's is your the, the famous snot, snot cover so you know this is the this is the cover where he looks like king kong has been crying i don't blame him at this point which issue number is this this is number 132 march of 77 so this is the 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 rise before the fall or this is the beginning before it all was destroyed by Star Wars. And I'm sure Bratu has talked about all of this. But this is like, this is famous monsters before Star Wars happened and Close Encounters and whatever else came after that kind of changed famous monsters. Here's an issue of Creepy. This is a super summer special. Um, so I can also remember when this came out. Um, what year is this? October 76. So this would be at the beginning of me discovering Creepy. This was at the, I think I really just started buying and discovering Warren magazines in about 75 and 76. I think this is one of those issues. So you get this great Frazetta cover. And I feel like every issue, I mean every issue, I think every story, is every story? No, it's not. I don't know what I'm talking about. No. I'm, I'm high. I'm not thinking clearly. This is so great. I love the color inserts. The Richard Corbin. Creepy. Here is the Castle of Frankenstein Monster Annual 1967 Fear Book. It's kind of beat up. But it's a great issue. Great cover. I love the back cover. I wish mine didn't have a little pencil number 40 on it. But I guess I could somehow maybe try and erase that. This is a great, great magazine. The last thing we have is Marvel is another one of these... Uh, Quality Magazine, 
British Imports. It's the Marvel Man Special Number One. This is uh, Alan Moore stuff in here, and then reprints, I think. This was the Marvel Man that I actually liked, I remembered. I like the older stuff or the stuff that's like supposed to look like it's older stuff. I wasn't really into that newer stuff that kind of looked like it was just about people talking. This looks like it's a ripoff of, of course, you know, Captain Marvel. Here's a cool advertisement for 24 quality badges. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys have a fantastic day or evening. I think we'll make this our thumbnail. Talk to you later.